Okay, we're coming back to you with Dr. Karen Bondar, uh, the biologist from Canada. Now, you got your PhD in biology, yes. and you did this in Canada. I did, yes, at the University of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So uh, there wasn't a whole lot of space components to that. That was a, a study based on ecosystems and community ecology. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, since then, I've started a career as a science communicator. So I talk about all sorts of interesting sciences, as well as the biological re relevance in a lot of different aspects of science. Now, as a young girl growing up in Canada, uh, now, you know, most people, if they're aware of where Canada is in space, uh, they're famous for the famous arm, the arm that's mm, mounted. Arm, that's right, in the space shuttle, and it was, of course, the primary component in being able to capture and release satellites for repair and launching satellites and various other work projects. What else has Canada done, and why were you inspired uh, to think about space? So, the Canadian space program is very active, and you know one of my heroes, the, despite the fact that I'm not related to her, is Roberta Bondar, who is a, you know a Canadian, a female Canadian astronaut. There's a lot of really interesting um, aspects of things that are being looked at, and the things that are most interesting to me, I guess, is uh, some of the, the very basic questions about biology, plant biology, for example. Will we be able to have plants photosynthesizing in zero G? Or if there is cosmic radiation, how is this going to impact the ability of a plant to take up water and to produce sugar? These are the kinds of questions that I think are very interesting because it's taking the basics and twisting them completely at, you know, into a new environment. And so um, some of those kinds of questions are the ones I think are you know, among the most important ones. Now, in your study of biology, and as you're moving through your particular interest, where do you see your personal uh, horizons in your studies or in your, how you can apply what you've learned? Well, gosh, that's a great question. Every different uh, venue that I go to or every uh, project that I'm involved with, it's neat to sort of step back and look at what I've been exposed to and the things that I've learned. So this one is a big one for me, uh, coming into all of these different areas of astronomy and the fact that there are so many people here that are a little surprised that a biologist is here. There's been a lot that I have uh, picked up from that, but I hope that there's been some that I've managed to inspire as well. The whole sex question, the whole plant biology question, all of these things are, are relevant and uh, we need to be thinking about those kinds of things from various perspectives, not just one. And we need to also appreciate that to be a space scientist doesn't mean you have to be an astronaut. You can basically study any aspect of science and be a very successful space scientist. Um, so I'm going to take away a lot of that diversity. I'm going to take away a lot of uh, what I've learned from people and looking through solar telescopes and things that I haven't done before. So, you know, it's really cool to kind of interact with people that you don't normally see, especially in a, a very relaxed and fun environment like this has been. Yeah, so now you're here at the Arizona Science and Astronomy Expo as a guest speaker. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and how did that come to pass? Were you just invited? Or did somebody hear So, about you? yeah, the power of social media. This is a testament to the power of social media. I met uh, Jeff Nakin, one of the meteorite men, on Twitter. And uh, we've been going back and forth on Twitter, gosh, probably for a couple of years now. And, you know, we have similar interests. And, and when you're in various social media groups, you tend to retweet and support the tweets of, of other people that you know. And my invitation to come and speak here came from him. Oh. Uh, one of the organizers of the entire symposium, uh, Alan Trano, uh, asked Jeff if he knew of a female science communicator that could come and, and discuss things. And here I am. Well, so, you know, it's great. The, the social media is changing everything. And it's changing a lot of aspects of science which is cool. Like that's to see science being celebrated and put out there in oh, so many different ways is really, really cool. Oh, uh, and I just want to add, that's a part of the communication level that is part of learning, isn't it, right? Absolutely. I mean, you learn and the communication becomes so simple now. And, and it's so, it, exactly, it is so simple now. We can take, we've just done a little uploaded video that's live. We can take photos and they're all of a sudden out there. But as far as those of us talking about science, we can tweet these links and we can say, hey, I'm hanging out with Phil Blade this weekend. Yes. I'm here at this astronomy expo. And then all of a sudden people are like, well, why are you at the astronomy expo? 
And then the questions start flowing from there. It's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to be in this field. And as far as uh, inspiring others, how do you feel about uh, you being a young woman uh, with a, a, a real uh, kind of a niche yeah. and going into a, a field that's new for females? I mean, really? And, and the way history's treated women, you know, and uh, rightly that we're moving in these new directions. How do you feel about young girls? What would you want to say to a young girl about, you know, her ideas of what she might think of what she wants to do? Yeah, I have a lot of things to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think there's a couple of different aspects of it. I, oh, first of all, I celebrate being a female. I don't consider it a burden. I don't consider it a chip on my shoulder. I have four children at home. I have a lot of energy. Uh, so, I mean, and look, biology is dictating to us that we must have the children. So, I mean, that's, you know, if you want to have kids, you've got to have them. So I absolutely will tell young women and do tell young women that uh, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to, to do both. And, you know, I do travel extensively for my career, and that's something that I, you know, you do get people who will, who will sort of look maybe down on, on mothering or what your role should be traditionally as a mother. Also, you'll get the scientists who can't understand why you can't come to something because you're busy taking your kid to soccer. So I'm, I'm very adamant about letting girls know that they can forgive themselves for all of those things and it's okay. And I'm living proof that, you know, it's not always perfect, but you can certainly do it. Absolutely. And if you had any advice you'd want to give everybody, and in closing, uh, I just want to just give you a chance to tell our audience, uh, what do you think uh, optimistically uh, we're looking at in terms of where we're headed as humanity? I mean, you can't want to know biology without understanding the history of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're connected, aren't they? Absolutely. And so do you, or how optimistic are you? What would be your advice? Is there any advice you have for people? It's tough. I think we need to look at very basic aspects of our biology for answers to things. Our brains are so big and our brains lead to a lot of confusion about uh, what we are and who we are. And I think that we also have a lot of brain power that's wasted on things like infighting and, and creating aspects of humanity that are negative. So, gosh, where are we heading? I, we're definitely heading to space, without question. Uh, who is going to be the big, the big winner in that as far as who is going to go or who is going to stay and how we're going to create new societies, those questions remain to be, to be answered for sure. But I feel like humanity is heading in a direction of space travel without a doubt. And we will, you know, there's the potential there to evolve into a new species depending on whether or not reproductive capabilities cease to exist between those that go and those that don't. So very interesting. Well, thank you, Karen. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you Likewise. for meeting our audience here on our CDVA <laughs> Network channel. And thank you, Leonard Holmberg. Well, thank you so much for coming all the way from Canada to speak to us. What a treat. So, Karen, I get asked a lot in my work, do I think there's intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? And I'm in agreement there absolutely has to be, statistically. And then there comes an argument which is, well, some people don't think it's very likely because you'd have to have just the right conditions and we need carbon, we need, we need water. Do we? How different, as a biologist, do you think alien life could be? My favorite reply to that question is, have you not seen Star Trek? <laughs> life form is made out of everything. Do, do you, this is your specialty, do you think it's reasonable that there could be life forms that are so different they've evolved in, in a totally different environment from what we think life requires? I certainly think that, uh, you know, it, I believe water is something that we can't do without or that life can't do without, but, you know, it, that's bending my mind a lot. Do I think life could have evolved elsewhere? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm in agreement with you and with Marcy that it is out there. Um, gosh, but without having carbon involved is what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, that's bending my mind. <laughs> Good, that's the idea. Now we have a really intense scientific yeah. discussion. I mean, we could, you know, that would be such an interesting discussion to have because what we need to look at is the properties of various elements, perhaps that are similar. Silicon, I hear somebody said. You yeah. Star Trek. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, a lot of times the the imaginations of all the people who are creating these uh, Hollywood shows and various, you know. The, they're the ones who are thinking outside the box, and scientists tend to be very, very uh, constricted a lot of times by, by what we know. 
it's, it's, it's liberating, but then it's also constricting. Gosh, I mean, I have a hard time envisioning it, but it, it's kind of random the way we evolved as well. So, I mean, it certainly would, would be perhaps pretentious of me to say, I doubt that it could have evolved in a different way. I certainly believe something, something evolved somewhere. But I do believe in evolution. <laughs> Wherever they are, they're surviving and reproducing. Yeah, I, I think it's probably possible. Mm -hmm.